So this is the respiratory system part three of the uh, pre-med uh, course for the spring session 2020. Yes, these are the objectives. By the end of the session, the students should be able to discuss anatomy of the pleura uh, that contains the visceral pleura, parietal pleura, and pleural cavity. Describe the anatomy of the tracheobronchial tree. Uh, describe the anatomy of the lungs in terms of location, shape, lobes, fissures, hilum, root, and another objective is discuss the bronchial and pulmonary circulation. This is important. Describe the diaphragm in terms of attachment, parts, opening, and the nerve supply. This, uh, so <coughs> this slide we have the pleura and the pleural cavity. Uh, pleura, just like the peritoneum and the pericardium, is a double a layer of uh, squamous type of epithelia that is called as mesothelium. So it's a mesothelial membrane and it is a double layer, the inner and the outer. The inner runs along with the surface of the lung and the outer uh, runs and attached with the outer wall of the thorax. So when we say outer wall of the thorax, thorax, so wall is called parietal. So th this layer is called parietal layer, and <clears throat> the inner surface of the lung, lung is an organ, and in Greek we say viscera. So that's why this layer is called as a visceral layer. So we have got pleura with two layers. This here, the short one, the blue color that runs on the surface, the visceral layer, and the red uh, that is outer one. And this outer parietal, it runs and it attaches to the inner surface of the thorax. So here we have got the rib cage. So it runs on the inner surface of the thoracic rib cage. And this area is the inner surface of the diaphragm. And this one, the space between the uh, two lungs where the heart is located, this space, uh, like here, this space, this space for the mediastinum from the top. To the end this area is called mediastinum so the parietal pleura that is here facing this mediastinum so this is called mediastinal pleura this is called this coastal pleura and this one is called diaphragmatic pleura so but these three names mediastinum and parietal uh, coastal and diaphragmatic they are named for the parietal uh, pleura for the visceral pleura we don't usually name like this we just say it's running on the surface. The pleural cavity is formed by the parietal pleura, visceral pleura, the pleura lining the thoracic wall uh, is the parietal pleura and the layer that runs on the surface is called as the visceral pleura. Now between these two pleura, uh, we have got a space and that space is called as the pleural space. Uh, just like the pericardium uh, double layer and the space between the two layers of the pericardium, visceral pericardium and parietal pericardium. Uh, the space is called uh, pericardial space. Similarly, in the abdomen, peritoneal cavity. Peritoneum is again a double layer, parietal and visceral. And the space between these two is called a peritoneal <coughs> space. So here again, we have got the pleura. Oh, with the space between the visceral and parietal pleura, that is space is called the pleural space. And uh, space means the cavity, it is also called as pleural cavity <coughs> present between the two layers. And what it contains in the space? It contains a fluid. That fluid is actually a very thin film of fluid. And this is a serous fluid because this membrane, the pleural membrane, uh, is also called as a serous membrane because it secretes uh, some serous type of secretions. I thought you know secretions are of two types, mucinous and serous. Mucinous more slow lubricated and more um, uh, oily and serous is more water and electrolytes based enzymes. Right? So here it is more water and electrolytes, serous type of secretions there by the serous uh, membrane. <coughs> but it acts, that slide one, that fluid uh, that is a serous one, that acts as a lubricant uh, and helps to hold the parietal and visceral pleura membrane together. So sometimes there are two functions. Just like here, it is mentioned that pleural membrane, they hold the parietal and visceral pleural membranes. Means they are using for sticking together 
not to be apart because when the parietal pleura is lifted along with the thoracic cage during inhalation uh, the sticking that is sticking with the, uh, the visceral pleura so visceral pleura is also lifted up uh, with the thoracic rib cage and visceral pleura since it is <coughs> stick and running on the surface of the lung so lung is also lifted up along with the lifting of the thoracic cage so that is very important then parietal pleura is highly sensitive to pain and visceral pleura is insensitive to pain pain you know this is one of the general type of sensation and for general or special for every type of sensation there are some receptors so this is a general uh, sensation and the pain for the pain there is no specialized uh, receptor for it uh, but how it that sense the pain uh, the last the terminal uh, exon the terminal part the, of the exon uh, it is totally uh, there is no myelination unmyelinated and myelinated both have got the Schwann cells but here this is this terminal end is called as free nerve ending and this free nerve ending is without Schwann cell insulation so they are very sensitive to the uh, pain type of uh, uh, sensation so they are called as free nerve endings so wherever the pain is sensed it is sensed without any special uh, receptor right the nerve they don't have the Schwann cell covering so exon is directly in touch with the surface and anything happen is stretching or things uh, damage it is sensed very quickly very powerfully so out of these two layers the visceral is insensitive if you cut the visceral layer if there is any disease from inside of the lung and is coming only touching the surface uh, of the lung so visceral pleura it the person will not feel pain and that's why most of the tumors and cancer of the care of the lung uh, is senseless till it touches the parietal pleura parietal pleura is sensitive now parts of the parietal pleura as we have discussed previously uh, parietal pleura the outer one the one that is uh, close to the uh, coastal side is called coastal pleura. The part of the parietal pleura corresponds to the wall with which they are associated. Coastal pleura, the pleura that is in contact with the uh, coastal inner surface of the costae, means inner surface of the rib cage. So that surface is called coastal surface. Diaphragmatic pleura, so diaphragmatic. Parietal pleura is actually is the pleura covering the superior surface of the diaphragm. Mediastinal pleura, the pleura that is uh, facing the mediastinum. So this area, this is the mediastinal parietal pleura, right? Because this is the hilum with the lungs, uh, bronchi and the pulmonary artery, vein, lymph, nerves, and this whole area, this membrane parietal is facing the mediastinum. So it is mediastinal pleura, and this one. This area that is touching the diaphragm, the lower side, so this is called the diaphragmatic pleura. And what is here between the ribs? So it is called as a coastal pleura. So coastal, diaphragmatic, parietal, uh, all three they are uh, actually the parts of the parietal pleura. Then there is another one that is called a cervical pleura. It is the cervical extension of the pleura. So at here, if you see here, you can see this is not facing anything. It is above. Uh, the level of the first rib and they are above uh, they are in the neck actually so in relation to the neck this portion this parietal pleura is called the cervical pleura then pleural recesses recesses means narrow spaces pleural recesses are potential spaces within the thorax potential spaces means means uh, just like uh, when we say to someone Yes, uh, this boy has got the potential to uh, get uh, first position in the class, right? So potentials are something that is hidden; it is not visible. So we say that there are plural plural recesses that are potential spaces. Means there is some extra space, but that space is empty actually, right? So when the lung fully inflate, when you take a very deep breath. 
your lung size also increases. So where this balloon-like new uh, lung will go, it must have some space to move. Otherwise, it will uh, rupture the thoracic cage. So what will happen? Lower down the diaphragm. So the lower portion of the below the lung, there is a space in the parietal pleura, so that the lung when inflate. Can you see this yellow color? This yellow color is actually the parietal pleural layer and this uh, purple color, this is the lung itself. Always remember that the lung ends at thoracic vertebra. This is the posterior view, the scapula and, the, and this is the spine of the vertebral column, the posterior view and the posterior view T10. T10, 10 thoracic uh, vertebra, this is the last limit of the lung itself. But the, uh, with the lung, the visceral pleura, uh, visceral pleura ends with the lung. But the parietal pleura, it hangs down up to two vertebra below, T12. So the, from the back side, T12 is the lower limit for the parietal pleura. While the visceral pleura, it, since it is running attached with the surface of the lung, and lung ends at the T10 level, so visceral pleura uh, remains on the upper side and between the visceral and the uh, parietal lower limit this space this space is called as the uh, recess right so this recess is here from the posterior side and if you see from the front you can see this yellow color area right so this yellow color here particularly on the mediastinal side so this is another potential space so lung can expand anteriorly within this space within this recess and lung can also inflate uh, when it is fully inflated it can go down up to the T12 level right so this is the potential space within the thorax where two layers of the parietal pleura lie in close apposition so here if you see the uh, yellow color this yellow color is actually the parietal pleura so parietal pleura uh, from the back side and the parietal pleura from the front you will see uh, in the next slide, hopefully, costo mediastinal recess is between costal pleura and the mediastinal pleura. Now, what is costal pleura and what is mediastinal pleura? Costal pleura, the anterolateral surface of the lung. So, pleura of this side, the costal, costal pleura, right? And the mediastinal is facing the mediastinum. So there is an angle here. He is talking about this pleura from vertical, right? So this border, this is the junction between the coastal surface and the mediastinal surface inside. So this is the yellow color space. This is called the costo mediastinal because coastal and then mediastinal, where the two, these two surfaces they are joining, this is called the costo mediastinal recess. So recess is the space within the two parietal uh, layers of two surfaces, the coastal surface, the coastal part of the parietal layer and the mediastinal part of the parietal layer. They merge over here. So this yellow color is a merger between the coastal and the mediastinal. Similarly, if you go down here with the diaphragm in relation to the diaphragm, particularly here at the back, you will find coastal, right? And then on the front, you will find the diaphragm. So diaphragm is here. So between coastal and the diaphragm, the inferior surface, this yellow part, not this, this yellow yellow part, inferior part. Here you will find this is a junction between coastal and the diaphragmatic parietal pleura. So this yellow color, this is very good. Coastal and diaphragmatic. So since it is going going down. So here in the down area, in the yellow portion, it is totally comprising of the parietal layer. So which two layer of the parietal? The coastal surface layer and the diaphragmatic surface layer. They merge here and this angle this is sometimes called as the coastal diaphragmatic angle in the clinical side. So these are the races, the coastal diaphragmatic races. So lower down, you will find coastal diaphragmatic races. And on the medial mediastinum anteriorly, you will find vertically the costo mediastinal recess.
So costodiaphragmatic rashes is between diaphragm and the thoracic wall, parietal pleura. The borders of the lung extend into the pleural recess during inspiration. Pleural effusion can collect in them. So what is the purpose? Previously I have discussed you that during full inflation of the lung, expansion of the lung, that lung can go into this potential recess. So this recess is costodiaphragmatic recess and this recess is called costomediastinal recess. So yellow here and yellow here. So there are two recess. So what happens during full inflation, during inspiration, the lung move into these two spaces plus the pleural effusion. Effusion means extra fluid uh, that comes out usually in the diseases, pleural edema. So commonly known as pleural edema. Whenever there is a heart failure and back pressure makes the fluid uh, tension in the capillaries here in the lung and there is more diffusion out into the tissue. So that extra fluid will accumulate in these potential recesses. So anteriorly, the fluid does not accumulate because due to gravity, that fluid comes here and then it trickles down to the lowest uh, part of the recess. So here this is the main site. If in the chest X-ray, you will find there is a pulmonary edema, so extra fluid will go and accumulate into this angle. So this is called our pleural effusion, means pulmonary edema. The, the effusion, the edema or the water, interstitial fluid accumulate within the pleura. So these rashes, they are parietal pleura. So this parietal pleura, the space uh, inside these two layers of parietal pleura, that space will contain the edema, edematous fluid. So that is called a pleural effusion. Then these recesses provide space for lung expansion and safe site for pleural fluid drainage. So in pulmonary edema, when the fluid comes out of the tissue, it accumulates here and due to gravitational pull, all they drain in the erect position, standing position, they all fluid come here. So if you want to uh, relieve the symptoms, the breathlessness of the patient, you have to remove the fluid from here so that that space will be replaced by the lung so when the lung will expand during inspiration it can easily go into this empty space this space must be always empty but if during any disease pulmonary edema or the fluid accumulate in this pleura parietal pleura so that's called the pleural effusion it will restrict it will not allow the lung to inflate completely so lung will remain small so the person cannot inspire uh, complete air, required amount of air. Then the trachea, trachea anatomically 10 cm long, fibrocartilaginous tube. What do you mean by fiber and cartilage? You know cartilage, uh, there are three, three types, highline cartilage, uh, elastic cartilage and uh, reticular and fibrous cart fibrocartilage. So fibrocartilage fibrocartilaginous uh, tube so this uh, tube contains fibers and the cartilage but here the cartilage type is hyaline cartilage so hyaline cartilage elastic cartilage and reticular cartilage uh, with trachealis muscle behind this is the cut section and in the cut section you will see this is the Highline cartilage C shape, right? It is not a complete circle, and the deficiency in the circle that is all filled by a muscle. So this is the muscle called as trachealis muscle. Trachealis muscle, its two ends, they are attached with the two ends of the highline cartilage, right? So it has purpose. So sometimes it contracts and it makes the lumen of the uh, trachea <coughs> smaller, constricted. And also, it also helps in the uh, movement, diastatic movement of the esophagus because esophagus is here and the posterior side. Extends. Extend from the required cartilage, C6 vertebra, to the level of the external angle. So what is the extent? Extent is this. This line is showing the extension, 
right the short form of the extension from where to where is the trachea this is the larynx right this is not the trachea so below the larynx the trachea starts at c6 <coughs> which level cervical sixth vertebra and it will end where here when it divides it divides into primary bronchi so they are not trachea so trachea is here so what is this point this is an, another imaginary point that sometimes we have discussed that this imaginary line attaches anteriorly with a manubro sternal joint anteriorly and posteriorly that imaginary line it runs horizontally backward and touches the intervertebral disc and which intervertebral disc it touches the intervertebral disc between t5 t4 and t5 right so this is the extension of the trachea from c6 to the point that is called as the level of the sternal angle so that imaginary line that touches anteriorly with the manubrial sternal joint and posteriorly with the disc disc between t4 and t5 <coughs> thoracic fourth and fifth that line that level is called the level of the external angle because this manubrial external joint it is clinically uh, called as the external angle because it's composed of two limbs two parts now made up of 16 to 20 incomplete cartilaginous rings so can you count this uh, uh, cartilaginous rings so how many they are they are about uh, 16 to 20 incomplete incomplete means like this means it is not a complete circle the sense of the word incomplete is incomplete circle right so c shape is called as c shape cartilaginous rings so these rings they are incomplete rings which provide rigidity to the tracheal wall so it gives rigidity rigid means stiffness so that this wall will not collapse just like here behind the trachea is the esophagus but esophagus in the wall of the esophagus there is usually no cartilage so what happens this muscular tube of the esophagus it is usually collapsed it is closed all the time except at the time of when the bolus is passing through peristatic movement right so all the time esophagus is closed normally trachea is never closed from the time of its uh, functional starts at the time of delivery till death this or after death it also remains open trachea don't close it and ensure that the trachea remains open at all the time at the level of the sternal angle the trachea bifurcates sternal angle this one so this is the imaginary line anteriorly touching the uh, manubrial sternal joint the sternal angle and posteriorly it attaches with the intervertebral disc between t4 and t4 and t5 so at this uh, imaginary line this trachea this trachea divides into two primary bronchus it bifurcates means divides into two into right and left primary bronchus carina carina is here if you pass a bronchoscope bronchoscopy uh, in medical terminology you have seen is a process of visualization of the bronchi so you pass a tube inside the oral cavity through the pharynx it goes to the larynx and larynx to the trachea and then it will go either primary bronchus or secondary bronchus so visualization of the bronchi so this tube when this tube comes here and it has not decided where right or left uh, it has to move this is a picture so this is the complete picture of two openings right so one is going on the right side the other one is going on the left side so right one is more diameter bigger diameter left one is smaller diameter so these two circles they are divided by a septum so the septum this wall this is called as the carina so this small uh, picture a small word this is the carina so when carina is visible from inside the trachea when you are inside the trachea at the point where the trachea divides into two primary bronchi at that side you will find the central septum that is called the carina internal medial ridge internal middle ridge in the lowermost tracheal cartilage so make it middle it is highly sensitive area and generates strong cuff when a foreign body enters in trachea and touches it 
so it means it is highly innervated by uh, hopefully glossopharyngeal because that is the main one that uh, and the vagus uh, that is responsible for the cuff reflex so they are highly innervated by these nerves so and they are very highly sensitive so anything that touches just like uh, if you observe uh, put something i stick in your oral cavity and touch the stick uh, the posterior wall of your oral cavity uh, when you go as you go and put your stick inside and tries to touch even the posterior anything automatically everything will be closed and cuff reflex very powerful cuff reflex will generate that is the reflex action the cuff reflex and this is all just because of the nervous plexus sensory nerves coming from the glossopharyngeal and the vagus same is true here for right then bronchial tree bronchial tree The trachea divides into two primary bronchi, the right primary bronchus, wider, shorter, and more vertical. Can you see this one? This is more wider, more wider. It is very short. These are division. So this one is not primary uh, bronchus. Primary bronchus is only this part because after this part, it is dividing into two, one and two. So this small portion only, this small where the whole red dot is actually hiding it. Uh, this is the uh, primary, right primary bronchus. It is very short, larger in diameter, and it is more vertical comparing to this one here from here to here. This is the primary bronchus because here primary bronchus into two secondary bronchus, right? The two division. So before the division, when it is single, this is the primary bronchus. So left primary bronchus is more horizontal, right? It is lesser in diameter and it is longer. The foreign body of the trachea more frequently fall into the uh, right bronchus because the diameter is uh, more and it is more vertical. It divides into three secondary bronchus and the left primary bronchus is a narrower, longer, more horizontal. It divides into two secondary bronchus. Why three secondary bronchus and two bro uh, secondary bronchus? Because on the right side, the lung has got three lobes. So according to the number of lungs, according to the number of lobes, uh, the primary bronchus of that side will divide. Here we have got three lobes, upper, middle and lower. So the secondaries, they are the number of the secondaries based on the number of lobes of that lung. So here we have got three lobes, so three secondary, upper secondary, middle secondary and the lower secondary. While on the right, left side, we have got two lobes only. Lungs has got two lobes. So that's why there are two secondaries, upper secondary and lower secondary. <clears throat> the secondary, uh, they are also called as lobar. In, in terms of lobes, lobar bronchi. So the, sec the second name of the secondary bronchus is lobar bronchi. Each of the lung, then it divides into segmental or tertiary bronchus. <clears throat> Actually, after secondary, it should be tertiary, right? Now come to the tertiary. So primary, then secondary, and this secondary, now it is dividing into its further branches. Now when you are, the secondary bronchus is in one lobe, right? So one lobe here, let's suppose there is a superior lobe and there is an inferior lobe. Superior lobe contains five segments on the left side. So left upper lobe of the lung contains within inside the lobe it has got segments so how many segments there are five segments similarly five segments on the lower side these branches they are not according to the number of the segments so don't suppose that they are one two three four five six no just remember what is the anatomy so this is not for uh, this is for another discussion showing this thing right so it is not correct here so just remember, we have got in next slides, uh, you will see the segments. So those uh, tertiary bronchi, they are called as the segmental bronchi because the tertiaries, they go into the segments and the secondaries, they go into the lobes. So secondaries, they are called lobar bronchi and the tertiaries, they are called segmental bronchi. Tertiary bronchi divides successively into bronchioles, 
terminal bronchioles, respiratory bronchiole, alveolar ducts, alveolar sac. So here keep on dividing, dividing, dividing and there are different names along the course. The last one is the uh, alveolar sac, alveolar duct, respiratory bronchi. So this is sac. Sac is composed like a uh, like a uh, bunch of grapes, right? But inside this is a sac. This is a pouch. The wall of the sac it is composed of alveoli. So you can see small alveoli. They are very small, 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 small. But these alveoli form the wall of the duct, wall of the sac. Sorry, wall of the sac. So these are sac, called as alveolar sac. So one, two, three, four sac are visible here, and the wall of the sac they are composed of small, small, tiny alveoli, right? And these sac they are connected with the alveolar duct, right? So alveolar duct goes into the with successive branching of the bronchi, uh, bronchial tree amount of cartilage decreases and the amount of smooth muscle increases. This allows the variation in the airway diameter. Now, what can, can you see this cartilage, ring shape cartilage, right, high line cartilage, as it moves down with division and division, the, cart, the size of the cartilage decreases, right, as you move distal, right, and the number of smooth muscles increases as you go distal uh, from the bronchopulmonary tree, from the trachea, proximal part, to the distal part, distal, so as you move distal, what will happen? Two changes will occur. The hyaline cartilages, the number of hyaline cartilages, the size of the hyaline cartilage decreases, but the uh, number and the uh, size of the smooth muscle, it increases, right? This allows variation in airway diameter. So this is smooth muscle, smooth muscles, uh, circular smooth muscle. When it constrict, it narrow the diameter of the bronchi. So here the meaning of diameter variation in the airway diameter is bronchoconstriction and bronchodilation. So in sympathetic activity, what happens? Bronchodilation occurs. So bronchi, bronchioles here, they all dilate to get more air in during sympathetic active activity. And in during bronco uh, parasympathetic, it usually constrict because less amount of oxygen is required at that comparing to the sympathetic. Now, then the respiratory zones, the respiratory zone is the site of the exchange of gases. Now, what do you mean by respiration? Respiration means wherever there is a gaseous exchange can take place. So, the lungs where the gaseous exchange actually takes place is the only part that is called as the alveoli. Where there is no alveoli, there is no possibility of gaseous exchange. So, when there is no possibility of gaseous exchange, so that part of the lung, just like the trachea, it does not contain the alveoli. Primary bronchus don't con does not contain the alveoli. Secondary bronchus, tertiary bronchus, terminal bronchus, there is no alveoli all along this pathway. So this part is called as the non-respiratory part, right? And the part, the bronchial, uh, respiratory bronchial, alveolar duct, alveolar sac, alveolus, they are all able to get the gaseous exchange. So they are called as the respiratory zone the site where the gaseous exchange it consists of respiratory bronchiole respiratory bronchioles it is a bronchiole but respiration is possible because in this bronchiole the first alveolus it appears in the wall of the bronchiole capable of gaseous exchange so that's why this bronchiole is called as the respiratory bronchiole later on alveolar duct also contain alveolar alveolar sac a bunch of alveolus. Alveolus are thin walled air sacs lined with simple squamous epithelium surrounded by the network of capillaries specialized for diffusion of gases. So now this is the histology that how the alveolus, each alveolus is formed. If you see this, uh, this is the alveolar sac. The wall is formed by the alveoli, right? The cut section and inside you will find that this is the alveolar duct. And alveolar duct is continuous with the respiratory bronchiole. So this is the one alveolar appearing here in the alveolar duct. So if you go inside the epithelium here, this is actually the simple squamous epithelium surrounded by the network of capillaries. Can you see so many capillaries surrounding the alveoli? 
the small ball small ball alveoli and they are all covered up by the capillaries arterial and veins so which capillary this is the pulmonary pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins they only go to the part of the lung where gaseous exchange can take place where it can get the blood oxygenated so that's why when you think about the blood supply of the lung it is pulmonary artery but pulmonary artery only goes to the alveoli what about the remaining part the bronchi and the uh, from trachea primary bronchus secondary bronchus tertiary bronchus terminal bronchus who supply the blood to that part of the lung because that is also a lung part bronchopulmonary tree so that are all supplied by the bronchial arteries that is branch of the aorta chest x-ray very easy dark red line marks the diaphragm yes this is that oh sorry dark lung this is the diaphragm right and this blue color this is showing the space between the lungs so this is the mediastinal space and this black one is the actually the lung the lungs are suspended in their pleural cavities in the thorax and are attached to the mediastinum only by their roots now what is the concept of root root are these structures that are going inside and coming out of the lung so the structures they are called as the roots and this area this area where they are penetrating in and out this surface area of the lung that area the surface area is called as the hilum and these structures they are called as the root of the lung right so root of the lung inside the hilum of the lung so it is saying that the lung itself this whole lung uh, this whole lung is suspended in the pleural cavities in the thorax thorax pleura lung is actually uh, inside the pleural sac you can say the cavity inside the cavity bounded by the double layer of pleura so double layer of pleura uh, inside uh, the lung is placed so lung is placed inside the double layer of pleura and are attached to the mediastinum only by their roots so mediastinum is this surface so all these nerves they are attached by these structures the primary bronchus right <coughs> secondary bronchus then pulmonary artery pulmonary veins uh, nerves lymphatics they are all included as the root of the lungs lungs are cone shaped with the apex upward into the neck so this is the apex of the highest point apex for any pyramid we have got the apex and the base so this is the base of the lung and this is the apex of the lung in the triangles we have got apex opposite to the apex we have got the base of the lung surfaces of the lung so we have already discussed the surface this surface that are along the coastal the ribs this surface of the lung is called coastal surface that is anterior lateral and posterior right then we have got the mediastinum mediastinum is the surface of the lung that is facing the heart because heart is in the mediastinum that is facing the mediastinum so this portion this portion is the mediastinal surface of the lung because it is on the medial side <coughs> towards the heart and the other opposite side with it not shown here starting from here this area this is the hole on the back side the coastal surface and can you see this surface this surface this surface is the diaphragmatic surface or the inferior surface so this surface is mediastinal surface or medial surface this surface is called as the inferior surface or diaphragmatic surface and this surface is called as coastal surface or anterolateral surface so going on the opposite side and from the opposite side it comes here and joins up to this right so this is a very broad so these are the three surfaces if you come to the borders of the lungs inferior anterior and posterior borders what is the definition of borders borders are created where two surfaces join together two surfaces join together just like here this is the mediastinal surface and here this is the coastal surface on the others so coastal surface and mediastinal surface they are uniting here they are joining here so this border this is called as a here anterior border so this is one border similarly this is the inferior surface diaphragmatic surface and this is the mediastinal surface where these two surfaces are joining 
at this line so this line is called as the border so this border is called the inferior border so we have got inferior border we have got anterior border and we have got posterior border so posterior border is a broad border right so here this is the mediastinal surface and this is the coastal surface so coastal surface and mediastinal surface this very big area this is called as the posterior border so inferior border separates the base from the coastal surface separates the base from the coastal surface yes okay from the here he is talking about not from the mediastinal side so this is the again inferior border this is again inferior border but he is talking about this border this border is between which two surfaces the coastal surface and the diaphragmatic surface so this is the base and this is the coastal surface anterior and posterior border separate the coastal surface from the mediastinal surface so anterior border is this between the mediastinal and the coastal this is the anterior and if you go posterior here this is the posterior surface posterior border that is between the coastal surface and the mediastinal surface right so this is the posterior border hilum as we have discussed a slit slit means a small depression uh, through which the lung receives the main bronchus <coughs> blood vessel lymphatic nerves <coughs> these structures constitute the root of the lung so these structures they constitute the root of the lung so pulmonary uh, primary bronchus secondary bronchus pulmonary artery pulmonary vein nerves they are the name of the roots of the lung right and what is the hilum of the lung this area on the on which surface mediastinal surface or the medial surface the medial surface contains the uh, high lung then come to the right lung it is shorter than left because the of the liver on the right side so on the right side the liver is very big structure it lifts the diaphragm up and compresses the lung on the right side right so right side this lung is shorter because of the uh, lung. it has three lobes superior middle and inferior super mid superior middle and inferior divided by the fissure this is the horizontal fissure right and this is the oblique fissure so this is very easy so oblique fissure is oblique and horizontal is horizontal <coughs> left lung left lung is taller and narrower since there is no liver here but stomach is there but how, how is become taller because this heart moves more towards the two third of the heart portion is on the left side of the midline so in the midline two third of the heart part is on the left side while one third is on the right side so when it is two third on the left side it compresses the lung so when it compresses the lung here it is compressed and become more taller right so that's why it is called taller and narrower because the heart is toward the left side of a by more space on the mid side of the mediastinum it has an indentation indentation means some uh, cutting means some impression some cut edge so can you see this this indentation he is talking about this actually this is the part of the heart that is compressing the lung so this compression has made a notch here right so this notch is called the cardiac notch right and so this curve on the border anterior border of the this is the anterior border where the coastal and the mediastinal surface join together so on the anterior border of the left lung we have got a notch a depression that depression is due to the pushing of the heart to the left lung so this is called the cardiac notch right but he is talking about a cardiac impression impression is created on the surface so the mediastinal surface of the left lung if you go inside you will find a depression of for the lung for the heart so heart is actually compressing so when it compresses the mediastinal surface look here yes so here uh you can see this is the uh, left lung this is the high lung this is the anterior border and this is the posterior border posterior border here anterior border is this one very sharp and this is the notch this is called the cardiac notch notch is present on the border not on the surface right and on the surface you will find a very big depression this area this area this area is for impression of the heart because heart is compressing this lung so this whole big area this is called a cardiac impression 
and cardiac notch is on the anterior border right another thing along with the border you will find uh, it is separated by a single oblique uh, fissure so on the left side we have a superior and inferior lobes divided by oblique fissure only here we have got oblique fissure but this oblique fissure is between middle and inferior lobe and here the oblique fissure is between superior and inferior lobes then from the superior lobe of the left lung from the superior lobe of the left lung a tongue like extension lingula projects over the heart bulb heart bulge now can you see this this point where the cursor is there this pointer is showing a tongue like protrusion right this is a notch that depression is called cardiac notch that is on the anterior border right but this piece that uh, appears due to this depression as a tongue like extension so this is the called as the lingula lingua means glosso means tongue so this is tongue like extension but where it is in which lobe lingula is part of superior lobe or the inferior lobe it is a part of the superior lobe right so this thing now this is the slide that i was talking about uh, bronchopulmonary segments so bronchopulmonary segments are isolated anatomical function in surgical units of the lung each segment they are working independently right so if there is any one segment that is uh, diseased you, know, you can remove that segment similarly the lobes they are also functioning independently every lobe has got its own bronchi its own pulmonary branch its own vein nerve lymphatics right so if there is any tumor cancer you can only remove only one lobe so god is very blessed with us that you don't remove all the lungs on one side you just remove the uh, individual lobes or the individual segments so each segment is has a segmental bronchus so within the segments the bronchus that is present inside the segment they are called segmental bronchus segmental bronchus which bronchus is this primary secondary or tertiary these are tertiary bronchus so tertiary bronchus also called as segmental bronchus a segmental artery and the lymph vessels and nerves a disease segment can be removed surgically without affecting the rest of the lung so you can see so you have to remember and on the right side we have got both the lungs contain 10 segments each so 10 segments each upper middle and the lower 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 similarly here 5 and 5 so this is very important to know right then we have got the blood supply of the lung pulmonary arteries i told you the alveoli this alveoli the pulmonary artery that is coming from the uh, arising from the right ventricle taking the deoxygenated blood pulmonary trunk divided into right and left pulmonary arteries so where it goes in the respiratory system it goes only to the alveolar part because they just need oxygen right so for oxygenation where oxygenation is taking place only at the alveoli alveoli is the only part of the respiratory system that is capable of gaseous exchange because it's very thin and you can see all these capillaries these are the capillaries arterial capillary because the artery pulmonary artery divides into smaller 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 capillaries and capillaries join to form the vein 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 and then pulmonary vein pulmonary vein is red color and pulmonary artery is uh, blue color so they are and also mossing here cap forming capillaries around the alveoli no other part is supplied blood by the pulmonary the other part of the pulmonary they are supplied by the bronchial artery bronchial artery supply oxygenated blood to the lung because bronchial artery these are the branches of the aorta and aorta supply the oxygenated blood so aorta gives from the trachea primary bronchus secondary bronchus tertiary bronchus terminal bronchus or the bronchial part respiratory bronchial even the respiratory bronchial because in the respiratory bronchial the wall contains the alveolus so alveolus will get the blood supply but the wall they will get blood supply from the bronchial artery so bronchial artery get oxygenated blood and they are derived from the thoracic aorta from the upper aortic intercostal arteries so thoracic aorta means descending aorta and uh, upper intercostal arteries particularly on the right side bronchial veins carry deoxygenated blood away from the lung tissue okay 
or the muscles that are used for powerful inhalation or inspiration first of all for inhalation you have to lift up all the ribs of the uh, rib cage so for lifting the ribs up you have to use the first rib as to anchor somewhere so that the lower ribs uh, will be lifted up right so because all the uh, lower uh, intercostal muscles they are pulling the upper uh, ribs <clears throat> so that they can lift the lower uh, ribs up so first rib should also be lifted up so this first rib is lifted up by the sternocleidomastoid elevates the sternum so it lifts elevates the sternum also anteroposterior diameter increases and the scalene muscles that fix or elevates the ribs first rib and the second ribs to which they are attached then external intercostal muscles elevates the ribs 2 to 12 so first is lifted by the sternocleidomastoid and scalene and 2 to 12 they are actually lifted lifted up by the external intercostal muscles pectoris minor this muscle this also lifts the uh, ribs to uh, 3 4 5 not 2 then intercostal intercost internal intercostal muscles internal intercostal muscle is also a very initial and powerful muscle of expiration but look what is written below internal intercostal muscle intercartilaginous part of the internal intercostal muscle what is the intercartilaginous part this is the cartilage right so the muscles this one this muscle because intercostal space intercostal muscles they start from the sternum while the external intercostal muscles they start from the uh, costochondral joint right so this is the external intercostal muscle and this is the intercartilaginous part of the internal intercostal muscle and remaining part here it is shown here because it is continuous behind the external intercostal so that behind part is visible here on the left side so this is the interosseous part of the intercostal internal intercostal muscle right so interosseous part means between the intercostal uh, interosseous part of the internal intercostal muscle it helps in force expiration while the intercartilaginous part it helps in inspiration right aid in elevating the ribs then we have got the diaphragm descends and increases depth of the thoracic cavity diaphragm is actually the inferior the floor of the thoracic cage this floor when it contracts initially it is actually a dome shape can you see this uh, this is the inactive form this is a dome shape this red color this is the shape from the lateral side the view of the diaphragm muscle so this very whole big dome shape muscle is inactive like this but during inspiration it contracts when it contracts it become more straight it go down it become more straight and it has gone down so from this one to this one it goes down so this is a doom shape curved muscle when it contracts it go down when it goes down it increases the vertical diameter of the thoracic cage now coming to the force expiration as we internal intercostal muscle but which part of the internal intercostal muscle the interosseous part so it depresses the ribs 1 to 11 narrow thoracic cavity <clears throat> so the thoracic cavity is narrowed because it is depressing it is uh, pulling all the ribs downward then the diaphragm ascends and reduces the depth of the thoracic cavity it ascends here it is descending here it is ascending here it is ascending so when it ascends it pushes the lung from the lower side the floor is lifted up so the size of the lung become smaller so air what is inside the lung it is expelled out rectus abdominis muscle right and the external abdominal external oblique abdominal oblique external oblique muscle right both of them they depresses the lower ribs these are attached with the lower border of the uh, rib cage with the cartilage and these are attached with the lower part of the ribs uh, external oblique so what they do they fix the lower part just like they are fixing here the upper part for inspiration for expiration they are pulling the lower part of the rib anteriorly right and at the same time they are also compressing the content of the abdomen here 
because when the muscles of the abdomen they contract they make it straight so when they straight the content it goes back into the cavity and it lifts this diaphragm up so when this diaphragm is lifted up it pushes the lungs and air goes out of the lung in the next slide this is the animation just showing the this is the role of the diaphragm when this is contraction it becomes straight and when it is relaxed it is dome shape when it contracts the anteroposterior diameter increases and it helps in inspiration when it relaxes it becomes dome shape and that anteroposterior diameter is smaller and air can go easily this is the uh, intercostal muscle between the ribs so these ribs uh, intercostal muscles when they contract they lift the ribs up right so for lifting the ribs up the first rib is lifted by the sternal cord uh, skeletal muscles and external skeletal mastoid muscles and for uh, exhalation the lower ribs they are attached with the rectus abdominis and the so both action occur simultaneously otherwise not effective to inhale is an active process inhalation is an active process and exhalation okay this is the diaphragm and diaphragm you can see the muscular partition between thorax and abdomen the muscles are attached in the peripheral part so periphery the ribs right and the coastal cartilages so these are coastal cartilages and these are rib and there are some vertebra here so all these are the circular muscles that are coming and attached to the lower portion of the rib cage right and then they are all ascend up and they are all attached by transforming their self into a tendon white tendon this white tendon is their insertion so they are all attached in the center so tendinous part and this is the muscular part peripheral muscular central tendinous now peripheral muscular part and that central tendinous part important muscle of respiration between the chest and the abdomen then come to the openings of the diaphragm so what openings are there so aorta esophagus and inferior vena cava aorta is this one red color that is the most posterior one and then we have got the aorta and this is the esophagus and this is the inferior vena cava what is the level aorta is at thoracic 12 level and we have got 10th thoracic vertebra vertebral level esophageal and 8th thoracic vertebral level inferior vena cava functions of diaphragm acts as muscle muscle of inspiration muscle of abdominal straining weight lifting muscle and thoraco abdominal pump thoraco abdominal pump means just like in the lymphatic system we discussed that the thorax due to the movement of the diaphragm Uh, it makes some uh, intra uh, negative pressure inside the thoracic cavity right so during inspiration inspiration is done by the lifting of the ribs right so what happens the inside the thorax inside the lungs inside the pleura we have got negative uh, 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 pressure so what negative pressure cause it causes a suction so through the openings in the thoracic region on the upper side larynx the air is sucked in and lower down in the thorax uh, the diaphragm has got these vessels so inferior vena cava and the uh, uh, lymphatic ducts the thoracic duct that is coming from the abdomen from the cisterna cale it is also assisted to go uh, up into the thoracic region then weight lifting muscles diaphragm is also used if you lift a heavy weight you can feel that your diaphragm is struck and for abdominal straining it means when we are pushing then we have got uh, blood supply of the diaphragm if you see the diaphragm this is the left pericardiophrenic artery right pericardiophrenic artery pericardiophrenic means pericardium and the phrenic phrenic means diaphragm so there is a blood supply internal thoracic artery actually it divides into two branches musculophrenic and pericardiophrenic these are the branches of the internal thoracic artery so these branches they supply the thoracic surface of the diaphragm thoracic surface means superior surface because it is facing the thorax and inferior surface is also called as the abdominal surface so inferior phrenic artery branch of the abdomen or aorta it supply the abdominal surface of the diaphragm so the abdominal surface this surface is supplied by inferior phrenic artery which is a branch of the abdominal aorta right and the superior surface this one the superior surface of the thoracic surface this is supplied by two branches 
pericardiacophrenic and musculophrenic. Phrenic, phrenic means diaphragm, diaphragm. So these are the two arteries that supply the two surfaces. Then come to the veins, drains by the brachiocephalic vein in the neck and the azygous venous system and abdominal veins. So azygous venous system, it gives intercostal veins, right? Just like the aorta gives the uh, intercostal uh, arteries. So this gives intercostal veins. They collect together to form azygous vein. And on the right side, on, on the left side, there are hemiazygous and accessory hemiazygous veins. All they are intercostal uh, veins. They drain ultimately azygous. Azygous drain into the superior vena cava, at the back of the superior vena cava. This is very important. From the front side, you cannot see the opening of the azygous vein. But we should know that the superior vena cava receives drainage of the deoxygenated blood from the thorax through the azygous vein. So veins drain into the brachiocephalic vein. The brachiocephalic vein is which? This one is the brachiocephalic. This one is the brachiocephalic vein. In the neck. So in the neck region by this internal jugular, subclavian, brachiocephalic. So all the veins they are coming from the upper side into the brachiocephalic and azygous vein also in the neck. Azygous venous system and abdominal veins. Abdominal veins uh, abdominal veins, they are coming from the lower side because this is zygous vein start from the abdomen. So you have to memorize that vein venous drainage of the uh, diaphragm. It is coming from the brachiocephalic drain into the brachiocephalic veins in the neck and the zygous venous system and all abdominal vein. The nerve supply of the diaphragm, motor nerve supply, phrenic nerve. Now, whenever you remember, Phrenic nerve, the motor nerve supply. It is coming from cervical 3, 4, this is the root value, right? So root value of this, just like this is one of the spinal nerve. So spinal nerve that is coming from the cervical region, uh, spinal nerve uh, that is formed by the C3, C4 and C5. They merge together to form the phrenic nerve on both the side, right side and left side. Sensory nerve supply to the diaphragm. Central portion of the diaphragm is uh, sensorily supplied uh, from the phrenic nerve and peripheral part by the lower six intercostal nerve. So central part means the tendinous part. So tendinous part is actually supplied by the phrenic nerve. So this phrenic nerve that is motor, it also contains a sensory part. So sensory uh, runs along with the phrenic and the peripheral part uh, of the sensory uh, peripheral part of the diaphragm is carried through the lower six intercostal nerve. Intercostal nerves, they are also spinal nerves. So lower six, not the upper six, the lower six intercostal nerves, they carry the sensory uh, part of the diaphragm only from the peripheral part. And from the central part, the sensation is all carried through the same phrenic nerve. You see, phrenic nerve it gives the motor, but the same phrenic nerve also carries the axons of the sensory neuron, right?